And then you guys can kind of make that decision for yourself. Do you think the Great Awakening did set the stage for the American Revolution or not? So I want to read uh, two, two pieces of thought. The first is from Tracy himself, kind of at the end of this book on, on the results of, of the Great Awakening. He says this, it would be saying too much to ascribe to the revival, that's the Great Awakening, any appreciable influence in producing the independence of the United States. So let me read that again. It would be saying too much to ascribe to the revival any appreciable influence in producing the independence of the United States. Though the waking up of a mind among men of all classes, the revival of those truths in which the free spirit of Puritanism has its had its origins, the earnest discussion of the principles of freedom and human rights, and the habit of contending for rights sturdily and with religious zeal, which was nourished among men of all orders, were doubtless useful in preparing many minds for the questions that awaited them. The causes of resistance to British aggression, however, were older and more general than the influence of the revival and operated strongly in the minds of families and classes that opposed it. But the revival, commencing when the mature men of the revolution were in their youth, was evidently a merciful provision against the dangers of that day. The demoralizing influence of war awaited the land. The political writings of Thomas Paine, though all of which there, through all of which there runs a secret vein of infidel metaph metaphysics, were to become popular. The country was about to be brought into close alliance and friendly intercourse with France, where infidelity was already rife and was soon to be openly predominant. The French Republic was to dazzle the world with promises of freedom more perfect than the world had ever seen, but of which infidelity was an essential constituent, and this country was to be under peculiar temptations to be deluded by them. The religious principles of the country that's America, needed to be strengthened in advance against all these dangers. With all the accession and strength that religion received from the revival, it did, but it did but just stand the shock. And for a long time, many of the pious feared that everything holy would be swept away. Strengthened by so many tens of thousands of converts and by the deep sense of the importance of religion produced in other tens of thousands, both in and out of the churches, religion survived and in time rallied and advanced and is mar marching on to victory. Okay, so that's Tracy's take. Pay attention. He says, look, the, the, the Great Awakening didn't have a direct influence on uh, the quest for American independence. But he said what it did do is prepare, kind of nourish Christianity nourish religion in the United States or in the colonies at the time, such that when they faced uh, European secularism, they had the religious tools and convictions by which to which stand withstand the onslaught of any. Particularly points out the French, French onslaught. Okay, so that's what Tracy says. He says it, the Great Awakening didn't actually inf have a direct influence on the American cause for independence, all right? Contrast that with, this is a book called America's God by Mark Knoll, and it traces, uh, it's from Jonathan Edwards to Abraham Lincoln, and traces kind of American theology and the nuances of American theology uh, in colonial period up through Abraham Lincoln, all right? Uh, it's a really thorough read. And uh, to think through the opposite understanding, he says this. A first curiosity concerns the religious history of the late colonial period, particularly the Great Awakening and its effects. It is a story of unintended consequences. Leaders of the Awakening from Jonathan Edwards in Northampton, Massachusetts, Joseph Bellamy in rural Connecticut, Gilbert Tennant, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and Samuel Davies in Virginia, to George Whitfield, who went everywhere, knew what they were after when they enlisted effective rhetoric to preach about intractable human depravity and supernal divine grace. We'll talk about this in a minute. 
They were trying to reawaken the church for the sake of the church itself, to reassert the sovereignty of God's divine love in conversion, to exalt the substitutionary penal work of Christ is God's way of reconciliation with sinners, to demonstrate the necessity of conversion as a prerequisite for truly virtuous living, and by these means to check the worldliness promoted by the era's new forms of commerce and entertainment. Yet the pursuit of such goals had ironic consequences. The Awakeners preached a higher, more spiritual vision of the church, yet the result was decline in the very notion of church and a transfer of religious commitment from the church to the nation. They focused on God's role in conversion, yet brought about an exaltation of human activity in the process of salvation. They preached a traditional doctrine of the atonement, yet opened the way toward redefining the work of Christ as an outworking of governmental relationships rather than the assuagement of God's wrath. They rooted true virtue in supernatural conversion, yet created conditions for a new concept of virtual living as in principle available to every person of nature alone. The unintended theological consequence of the awakening is the story told in chapter 3. In chapter 3, he details specifically how the Great Awakening and the events of the Great Awakening, the theological undertones of the Great Awakening, lead directly to the war for independence. So he makes the argument there is a kind of direct causal relationship between the Great Awakening and the American Revolution. All right. This one? Uh, the Great Awakening by Joseph Tracy. It's a fantastic, published by Banner. It's a fantastic book um, detailing that. So, so there, there are kind of two different streams of thought out there in thinking through the Great Awakening and how it may or may not have led to the American Revolution and the war for independence, all right? Uh, So we'll leave that for Steve to think through perhaps a bit more in the future, but what I want to do this morning is talk about the Great Awakening a little bit, what it was, the events of it, and specifically Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards is probably widely considered the greatest American thought leader, theologian, maybe put B.B. Warfield up there, but I would argue uh, Edwards is probably better. And uh, so we'll talk about him a little bit and then uh, what led up to that. So, but I, we want to understand the colonial America before Edwards, because Edwards does mark a, a, a dr- drastic shift in the understanding of religion itself and Christianity in the colonies, all right? So just briefly, a bit before, uh, before Edwards, when America was founded, famously, right, there was uh, Plymouth in the north, the Pilgrims, uh, who were Puritans, uh, it was Puritan separatists who initially went to Europe and then came over to the United States, or the colonies, to the New World, and they were Puritan, so English Puritans, uh, and were heavily influ- influenced by that, all right? And you can mostly assume that though there were other Protestant denominations in the United States, in the colonies at the time, even Catholic, uh, Catholics came over, that New English, New England Puritans did influence the heaviest uh, influence. They by far had the most theological writings, so famously uh, increase in Cotton Mather in New England, they, they lived and wrote kind of a little bit before Jonathan Edwards, they published like crazy. And, and even in England, uh, English Puritans were reading, were reading New, English, New England Puritans. Yeah? Is that the Puritanism or just the Yeah, good question. What, what is Puritanism? I guess uh, it's been a while since we've talked about that. So it's not officially a denomination. It's uh, initially spawned by the, the Puritan mu- movement, Puritan thought and theology was spawned by the desire to purify the Church of England. So the Protestant Reformation 
took place in England, was initially heavily influenced by Luther and, and was very kind of Lutheran, uh, but then uh, developed its own church and, and kind of took a lot of Catholicism with it as well and said, well, we're going to have a state church, the Church of England, and we're going to do very Catholic things. We just have changed some of the theology behind it. So uh, they had a lot of the forms, like the liturgical forms, the liturgical prayers, the, uh, had the, the Book of Common Prayer, which, which kind of delineated out all these things, how the, how the church in England was supposed to uh, carry itself and supposed to worship. And the, 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 the priests uh, of the Church of England had to wear the vestments and things like that. And so uh, Puritanism in England was born out of the desire to purify, get rid of that. They said, no, 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 that's still kind of vestments of the old Catholicism. We, we, that's bad for us. That's bad for the church. So we need to purify it, purify its doctrine. So have a truly reformed, Calvin, and they were, the Puritans were, were Calvinistic. They, they read John Calvin had John Calvin's understanding of salvation, of the church, a, a lot of those things. So they said, uh, no, we need to simplify it, get rid of all those extra things and, and be pure, God's pure church. So that's what the Puritans were. Uh, they, the initial kind of pushback was with Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, returned the country to Catholicism. So there was a bunch of people left then uh, and then after that, uh, Elizabeth brought back Protestantism, but really kind of established the Church of England again, and and really kind of forced a lot of uh, a lot of the old ways uh, back onto it. So the Puritans then developed after that in, in their desire to um, to purify the church, and then that was transferred to New England when the Pilgrims. And, and, and other uh, Puritans came over to New England, it was kind of like New England. In New England, uh, with, with very heavily influenced uh, Puritan, Puritanism. Uh, Virginia was very Church of England. Virginia was a officially uh, established as an official uh, British colony. Uh, so... Uh, you know, the, the, the governmental structure, it was very uh, Church of England. And the, the official church in Virginia was the Church of England. So if you go down to Jamestown, Williamsburg, that there's still an old church in Williamsburg itself, which is a Angli still, still an Anglican Episcopal church, uh, which is the, church of, the American version of the Church of England. So, um, so that's Puritanism, I guess, in a nutshell. Um, very heavily focused on piety, uh, outward, outward understandings of purity. Uh, but, but a couple of the other important aspects, especially in New England, uh, was, for, for one, a, a cohesive and, and holistic understanding for church and state, for public and private, for secular and sacred. So famously, the Puritans in New England especially said, well, God is God of everything. So we need to allow scripture to guide everything that we do. So the pastoral office is good and important, but so is so our secular jobs. We, we shouldn't have this strong division between the sacred and the, the sacred and the secular because we should make the secular sacred by being a christian within the context that we're in so whatever job that we have from a, a shoemaker or a blacksmith or whatever i should be allowing scripture to determine how it is that i go about that vocation in my life 
So absolutely, the, the, the Puritans really were the originators of this understanding that no, we as Christians should be in, in every, every sphere of life living out godly lives, uh, accomplishing God's purposes, because there should not be a, a distinction between the sacred and the, the, sacred and the secular, okay? Uh, and, and so they, uh, and that has its dangers, and, and we'll see that kind of had results then in the Great Awakening and afterwards, but they, they, they didn't create these strong divisions in, in one's life. So, for example, for example, in the relationship between church and state, Puritan England, the Westminster Assembly, was sanctioned by the state. The uh, assembly itself dictated doctrine that was to be held by the rest of the country. And and there was a a host of things there that we talked about. You can go back and and watch those lectures if if you want to think through that. But, but, But the relationship between church and state didn't have this Start sharp distinction in their in their understanding. Well, they, they said no. Uh, we're a a Christian nation, England. We're a Christian nation, New England. Uh, as, as the colonists came over, they said, well, we're we're a Christian colony. So the the church and state should work hand in hand to to both. Um, uh, to to promote civility, uh, public good, and th- to promote discipline and, you know, th- to punish wrongdoing. The-, the church and state are both responsible for that. And so uh, they had this, w- what you could call a-, a nationalized reformed covenant theology, a nationalized reformed covenant theology, where society was distinctly Christian. And so the church and the state, the government and the church, worked hand in hand to enforce civility and promote charity. And so then what that meant is to be a member of Christian society meant that you were then a, just a member of the church. There was no really kind of distinction. And so uh, there's a, an interesting problem that developed in New England where churches were very full of people who were not regenerate believers. Because if you were a good member of the state, that meant you should be a good member of the church. You were just, boom, you were maybe baptized when you were a baby, because the Puritans baptized babies for the most part. And... Did they christen you? Does that count? Baptizing? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if there's officially a distinction between christen, christening and baptism, but... Uh, yeah, they, they would baptize their babies as a, as a bringing them into God's covenant community. Right? They said the church is God's covenant community. And so, uh, but remember, that's very synonymous with Christian society. So if you're a good member of society, you're a good member of the church, which means you're just in, whether or not you were saved at all. And so the churches in New England especially were full of unregenerate people, non-Christians. Oh, well, officially non-Christians. Now they, they you know, would say that they were all Christians, uh, but, the, but they hadn't actually known, understand, and believed the gospel. So that, there was this, uh, this problem brewing in New England at the time where churches were full of, of people who weren't actually Christians. Yeah, well, so, yeah, absolutely. Christians throughout the centuries, but especially in a Christianized nation, uh, saw it as their responsibility to take care of society in all regards, whatever that looked like. So, so this was brewing in the, in the, in the 1600s. And in 1662, there was a, a compromise fleshed out in New England called the Halfway Covenant. The Halfway Covenant. Uh, 
And because there were, there were questions of, wait, should they really be church members if they're not Christians? How do we, how do we think through that? And so the halfway covenant was, as it, as it sounds, was kind of a, a halfway measure to try to appease both sides of this discussion. And what they, what they determined was it, it, it allowed unregenerate individuals to be church members and to baptize their children, but to not partake in the Lord's Supper. So it said, okay, you, you can be in the church, sit in the pews. You can even baptize your children, you know, your babies, when you have them. But if you're not actually a regenerate believer, you just don't take the Lord's Supper. Okay? This is the halfway, the halfway covenant. And, and that, that dominated the, the landscape until Edward. And if you have any questions, just stop me, and I'll try to answer as best as I can. But, but that kind of dominated the, the theological landscape until Edwards. Jonathan Edwards comes along. So, so in sum, pre-awakening religious America was one mostly devoted to traditional Protestant understandings, deference to in, inherited authority, all right? Deference to inherited authority, such as kings and rulers, Suspicious of self-assertion, so someone getting out in the public and asserting themselves too much, you're a bit suspicious of that. The being and actions of God as central and supreme, all right? And with the exception that regeneration is necessary conversion, which is what happens in the Great Awakening, and churches being filled with people who were never converted, churches, uh, as we just talked about, so they saw themselves as the covenant community regardless of converted, uh, of converted state of the individual was the rule of the day, pre-awakening, okay? And that is where Jonathan Edwards really enters the scene. So Edwards was born in 1703 and was a pastor, became a pastor in Northampton, Massachusetts. And I, and I want to say this. This is from a speech that Calvin Coolidge gave. President Calvin Coolidge gave this speech, ironic, uh, called The Price of Freedom, uh, his speeches and addresses, you can read that. And this was uh, in the speech delivered on the sesquicentennial, so the 70th, 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. He says this, no one can escape the conclusion that in the great outline of its principles, the declaration was the result of the religious teachings of the preceding period. The profound philosophy which Jonathan Edwards applied to theology had aroused the thought and prepared the colonists for this great event. So Calvin, for right or for wrong, again, you can, you can make that determination yourself whether Calvin Coolidge was right in this assertion or not. But he directly attributes the thought leading up to and the philosophy and the theology behind the Declaration of Independence, right? The Declaration of Independence, much more so than the Constitution, is full of theology. And he attributes that to Jonathan Edwards. All right. So Edwards came, comes on, so take that as what it is. Edwards comes onto the scene as a pastor in Northampton, Massachusetts. Very Puritan, very Calvinistic, understanding God's sovereignty and salvation, all right? And uh, the necessity of, uh, of, of inward piety. And uh, he, he did have some thoughts on politics, so I, I want to read some of those. Edwards says this, If men have nothing but human government to be a restraint upon their lusts without an omnipotent governor they are still left in a most woeful condition. Okay, so, so there is a role for human government, Edward says, and, and we'll get to that in a minute. But he says, if, if you're not actually a Christian, if you just exist under a government, but you don't exist in, in submission to God as your king, the omnipotent governor, well, you're really no better off, Edward says. 
you're still left in a a woeful condition. Even if you exist under a good government, uh, if if you don't submit your life to God in Christ, well then, you're, you're not really better off. But he does... He did believe that government fulfills its proper duty when it concerns itself with the protection of property rights, the maintenance of order, and establishment of justice. Uh, Which is is good. That's good and right. Uh, Yes. Well, uh, that's, that's the great understanding that one of the, the impacts of Edwards was he said, wait, wait a second, there does seem to be a biblical distinction between the, uh, how do I want to say this? You don't, success in life does not mean spiritual success, right? Again, there, there was kind of this understanding that, that those two things were that should be synonymous. If you're living in a good Christian society, everyone should be, should be well off and should be doing well, and, and there should be no persecution because everyone's Christian. Edwards said uh, that, that might not be the case uh, and, and was, was influential in that. Notice what Edwards I said, though, concerned with protection of property rights and the maintenance of order and establishment of justice. Steve's going to, well, I think we did look at John Locke a little bit. Steve's going to probably revisit it a little bit. But here's something important to know about Edwards. John, uh, I think this is what I want. Oh, yeah, this is uh, from an article by by Gordon Arnold said uh, about Jonathan Edwards, he says this, despite the fact that Edwards' metaphysical views clearly contrasted with the founding fathers. No, that's not what I want to read. This is from Mark Mark Knoll again, sorry. He says this, 20th century students are partially correct in drawing attention to the modernity of Edwards' intellectual universe. For he was influenced by the sensational epistemology of Locke's essay on on human understanding He marveled at the lofty regularities portrayed in Newton's science, it's Isaac Newton, and he accepted the affectational emphases in the new moral philosophy of his age. But if he was the colonial American who most deeply engaged the new era's thought, he was also the colonial American who most thoroughly repudiated it. So Edwards lived in 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 a time when John Locke's political philosophy was gaining major traction when Isaac Newton's uh, understanding and discovery of the laws of physics and the universe and all that kind of stuff was, was kind of really capturing the, the fascination of society at large. Like, what? There's, there's laws that govern the universe? Laws of motion that we take for granted now, right? Those were now kind of really taking hold in society, Isaac Newton, along with this kind of, uh, as we mentioned, French secularism and and some of the French philosophers. And and Edwards was really well studied in a lot of it. He wrestled with a lot of it. And and so you can even see there is some influence there. So when, when Edwards talks about the protection of property rights, maintenance of order, establishment of justice, those are very... John Lockean statements, right? That, that's heavily influenced by how Locke thinks about government. But Edwards is wrestling it with it from a Christian perspective. He's like, well, of all things, he's Puritan. So he says, but scripture needs to be the guide for how we think about all these things. So that's why he says he was the, the, the most prominent colonial thinker, wrestling with all these philosophies and things that are coming in. But because he was so deeply committed to scripture, he was the one who was actually then maybe able to most accurately and in a best manner actually repudiate the things that were wrong with it and, 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 and kind of critique it as a, as a Christian, Christian pastor and theologian. So 
so that's what kind of Edwards is, is wrestling with. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, John McCracken, who's an Edwards scholar, says this, Edwards' philosophical efforts mark also the beginning of constructive philosophy in, in America. To search the intellectual history of Edwards is to ask, not merely for the antecedents of a great thinker, but for the genealogy of a new race. So Edwards does seem to be a very clear inflection point in American understanding of theology and of how we think through society and what society should be. And where Edwards really starts hammering home on this is with the problem of churches being filled with non-believers. Yeah. He, he did gain a lot of prominence during his lifetime. Just like anyone, it took a little while for him. But a, he was truly a man of uh, strong intellectual prowess. And he was wrestling he, uh, with all these issues. He was writing, writing these things. Where, and where he really, I think, his game really stepped up was during the Great Awakening. Uh, so, and which we'll, we'll jump into in two seconds. So Edwards saw the problem of churches being filled with non-believers. And he said, this, this is not right. The church is a group of individuals who have individually professed faith in Jesus Christ for the atonement of their sin. It's not this covenantal community of if you're just baptized as a baby, you can be brought into it and call yourself a Christian and do whatever you want and, not, and live a completely secular life in the world, but then come to church on a Sunday and think you're doing okay. Edward says, that is not right. So Edwards preached the gospel, preached the necessity of being born again if you want to be part of the church, and said, oh, you, you want to be a member of our church? You, you, you have to actually show fruit in your life. You have to actually have some kind of outward manifestation that the Spirit is at work in you. And so Edwards hammered this home. And in the early 1930s, what it did in Northampton was actually start converting sinners. In a, in a, by God's grace, the preaching of the gospel, as it's prone to do when the Spirit's at work, uh, started converting sinners. Edward's church grew. The, the number of converts in, in his area grew. And uh, so... So Edwards' preaching of the gospel started having this effect in, in New England, uh, in Massachusetts, in kind of some of the surrounding towns. And, and so that kind of became known, that, that there was this uh, a little bit of awakening happening in New England. And it was started by Jonathan Edwards just preaching the gospel and saying, wait, uh, being, being a convert, being saved actually matters if you want to be in the church. And, and if you're not saved, well, then you're not part of the church. And yes, we, we need to see a conversion. Um, so so that, was, that was important. Edward's understanding of that was important. And, uh, and so the, it kind of percolated a little while in New England, uh, Meanwhile, we're not going to go too much into this. Meanwhile, in England, John and Charles Wesley uh, started uh, kind of having a renewed understanding of very similar-ish things of, of kind of uh, the, the, the solas of the Reformation. I don't want to call them Reformed because they have very Arminian doctrine, all right? Uh, but, but they were very not Catholic. They were very Protestant, I guess I'll say. Um, and, and they, they really, the Wesleys famously 
uh, focused hard on, on personal piety as well, on, uh, I mean, on small group kind of uh, living life together. You ask each other really hard questions. You can find this online, the, the, uh, John Wesley's small group questions. They would come and ask each other, what, what sin have you done in your, in your life this week? What sin are you currently harboring in your heart? I mean, really intense questions that they were supposed to ask each other. Um, and uh, so they were kind of had this uh, Methodist, they called they had a method, and so they were kind of this little Methodist movement, uh, initially part of the Church of England. Another Anglican Church of England preacher named George Whitfield also was converted around this time. Again, he was part of the church for many, many years, uh, and he would say, but I wasn't actually a Christian. I didn't understand the gospel. I didn't understand its implication for my life. He was actually converted and started preaching uh, in England, uh, but there was a, a rejection of him. He, come, he comes to the United States, or the colonies at the time, in 1940, 39, four, or 1739 and 40, and starts preaching in the colonies. And, and it was... Bet- between what had happened in the early 30s with Edwards and then Whitfield going basically up and down the East Coast, or the, co- the colonies at the time, preaching, again, preaching the new birth, preaching what they call the new birth, which is regeneration, regenerate conversion to be part of the church. Uh, Whitfield was preaching that. And so... Uh, that there were 19, or 1740 to 42 is is kind of the heart of the great great awakening where Whitfield is preaching. Uh, it's estimated there's about 25 to 50 thousand new converts during that time. In the colonies were about two million at the time. I think historians estimate uh, lived in in the colonies. So uh, there was a whole bunch of new churches started. Interestingly. Whitfield was rejected by the Church of England. So the Church of England had adopted a very Catholic understanding of the gospel. And so as Whitfield comes and is preaching, the the Church of England, his own church, in the colonies especially, rejected him. So uh, there there were Anglican preachers explicitly on Sunday preaching against John Whitfield with John Whitfield sitting right in the church. Uh, and, and he talks about, in his memoirs, how he would kind of go on long walks with some of these pastors and try to convince them, and they would try to convince him. And, and he said, we would leave in, in no better state than we were in, uh, with no better agreement, but uh, that was what was happening. So uh, he was trying to, st- he was here in, this, in the colonies to start an orphanage in Savannah. So he was... He, would, he kind of started in Georgia and South Carolina. He would go to Charleston a lot. He would see, Charleston was a place where he had a lot of initial converts, and he traveled up to New England, to Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey, uh, met with some of the other pastors who were, had kind of caught fire with what Edwards was preaching. And so there was this beautiful synergy of, of Edwards in the north and Whitfield uh, and, 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 uh, and some guys in New Jersey, tenant in New Jersey, and then Whitfield kind of all up and down, but starting in the South, preaching the same understanding of, well, you know, you need to be saved to be part of the church, and uh, you need, the, the spirit has to be at work in doing all these things. The Great Awakening was, uh, and, and the understanding of an individual commitment and in, in conversion to Jesus Christ, Okay. And again, I, I, I want to I hit that, the understanding of the individual, because I think that matters. Individual autonomy uh, was, a, was a big hallmark of this. And, and, and famously, during the Great Awakening, uh, Whitfield would preach, people would burst out in tears, people would fall over on the floor, and so there was a lot of kind of uh, very over-the-top emotional response to Whitfield's preaching. But he stood firm and had us both hands. Uh, 
Sure, uh, always. Yes, Colleen. Mm -hmm. What bad principles here in this colony and then have you this emotional obsession? So antisocial, so opposite of what you're saying. Yeah. I'm not a uh, social psychologist, so I don't, I can't really answer that other than to say, I mean, Puritanism was very reserved mm -hmm. itself. Um, uh, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter is not the best characterization of Puritanism, but he is picking up on, on certain themes and elements that, that existed, a, a, a focus on uh, of outward piety and outward reservedness. Um, again, r r suspicious of self-assertion, right? That, that, was, that was real. You, you, you shouldn't be sticking out in a crowd. That's not a good thing. You should be uh, reserved and, and, and hold your tongue and, and, and a certain demeanor. Yeah, that was, that was part of, uh, especially Puritan New England. Yeah. Um, so, so there was this massive uh, kind of just these highly emotional reactions and, and there, that, that caused itself some controversy. Is, is that real? Is that not real? Uh, is that just emotionalism and not real conversion? And, and certainly, there were some, there were many of the cases, I'm sure, where it was just an emotional response to a, a wonderful sermon. Whitfield, Whitfield was a, a fantastic preacher. And so, it's easy to have an emotional response to a great orator. Just like it's easy to, easy to have a an emotional response and a U2 concert, right? Uh, which is just why we do music the way we do here, because I don't want you to have the emotional response of a U2 concert. I want you to respond emotionally to the gospel that we sing about. Anyway, um, the, uh, so there was a lot of discussion and debate. Is this real? Is this not real? If you want to think through that, Edwards thought a lot about that, and he wrote on that. It, he wrote a treatise on a religious affection. Uh, how, do you, how can you actually maybe somewhat determine if someone's uh, emotional response to the preaching of the gospel is real or not? Uh, religious, the Religious Affections by John Edwards. It's a fantastic read. Probably will never be surpass, surpassed in, in thinking through uh, how do you... How do you determine what's a, a real response to the gospel and what's, a, what's not a real one? So take that as it is. Uh, I would, but um, so that's, that's, that was the Great Awakening. Um, and a lot of conversions, uh, Presbyterians, Congregationalists uh, were all kind of caught the fire. It didn't. The only denomination that didn't really catch the fire was the Church of England, the Episcopalians, because they, they rejected the preachers, uh, their own preachers, Whitfield especially. So they were kind of the main one that didn't catch it. But Baptists, Congregationalists, uh, New England Presbyterians, all of them kind of caught this. They, they saw massive numbers of converts, new churches being planted, uh, Pastors, uh, that was another thing that was interesting. Pre-Edwards, pre pastors didn't have to be converted either. You could be in the pulpit preaching the, preaching the God's word. Well, you probably weren't preaching God's word. You were probably preaching uh, whatever it is you felt like emotional you know, self-help for the day, whatever that looked like in the 1700s. Uh, you didn't have to be a converted Christian to preach the gospel, uh, to preach in the pulpit. And that's one of the things Edwards changed as well. But, but uh, kind of across the board, there's an understanding, wait, uh, the, the gospel, when preached rightly, can come to all these different Protestant denominations. So one of the interesting things that came out of this Great Awakening was an understanding of religious liberty. All right? Religious liberty. Wait a second. The gospel can convert people regardless of whether you're a Baptist or 
or a congregationalist or a Presbyterian. doesn't matter. The gospel, if the gospel and the spirit works in your heart and converts you, that's okay. All right? Um, so that, that is uh, one of the, I'll say these are two theological developments that pave the way for our understanding of minority rights. All right? When we think through the Constitution of the United States, one of the things that it hits home is that my, the minority has a, have rights. All right? that, was, that was new in the, Amer- in the American system of government, that if you're not the majority, you still have some rights as well. And, and, and the Great Awakening kind of helped, helped pave the way for that for two reasons. One, um, it, that there was religious liberty. And, and, and if you were converted, so uh, individual churches had autonomy. You, individual churches had autonomy, even among Presbyterian churches. So, the spirit converts, right. Um, so, so they said, I... Our church shouldn't be governed by people from a church down the road. And we should elect our own elders, and, uh, and as a church, we should elect them and shouldn't have someone else tell us who our elders should be, who are the people that should kind of be influencing us, and, and that shouldn't be mingled. Individual churches had jurisdictions. Right? That, that, that was an important development in, in, uh, in the Great Awakening or right after the Great Awakening. And secondly, they said the rights of membership can transfer to another church if it betters, it's better for your soul. So before, it was kind of looked down upon if, 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 I'm, if I'm in a church and the pastor, who might not be a Christian, but is preaching, he's not doing anything, for, like I'm not growing in Christ, but there's Greenbelt Baptist Church down the road whose pastor is preaching the gospel, I should be able to go, go to that church and hear the gospel actually being preached and have my soul fed. Before the Great Awakening, that was looked down upon. You, you, you should, no, you can't do that. You've got you to gotta be in your church. But, but that changed after the Great Awakening. So an understanding that the individual has a right. The individual has the right and the ability to make their own decisions about what's best for their own soul and in and, and relationship with God, okay? Uh, so, so at the, after the Great Awakening, there was an inflection point, again, with Edwards, and it, it was highlighted by the fact that Edwards was fired from his church, Right? Edwards was preaching, and he was fired from his church. So he, Edwards was, was kind of uh, still very Puritan, and, and theology and political thought had moved past him. He started it, and he, he kind of inspired it, but it moved past him. So, uh, you know, the dismissal of Edwards from his pulpit in 1750 was a seemingly explicit theological revolution taking place. Knoll says this, from the, revivals, from the revivals of the Great Awakening arose new evangelical churches, activities, instincts, and ways of expounding Christian doctrine. He says, before that rise could occur, older expectations from church and theology inherited from Europe had to give way. A process that ended with an intimate union between evangelical Protestant religion and revolutionary politics began with disruption in the historical colonial churches. So again, Noel makes the expl- explicit tie here to, uh, from between revolutionary politics and, and the kind of religion that was developing in the Great Awakening. Well, we are almost out of time. Uh, I'll try to Interestingly, one of the things that, that Tracy talks about will make a couple explicit ties to American politics, Amer, Amer, the American Revolution. Uh, Tracy says this: Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, 
the writer of the Declaration of Independence, right, in his youth had gained his first clear idea of a Republican government from seeing the congregationalism of a Baptist church in his vicinity. Though a French infidel in respect of religion, he was in favor of liberty everywhere. So, so Tracy makes the point that Jefferson learned uh, and really grew up in his understanding of Republican form of government in a Baptist congregational church. All right, so that's, that's interesting to think through. Uh, so I, I think what we have here, um, yeah, so the, uh, also the Great Awakening and Edwards in particular brought a rejection of the Puritan idea of a national covenant, all right? Uh, and we talked about this a bit when we talked about Knox, however many months ago that was. Uh, Knox had this understanding as well. The Great Awakening brought the rejection of that, 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 that a country would, or a, a, an area, a society, could covenant with God. That's why, I read, uh, that's why I read Second Chronicles at the beginning. They used, National Covenant uses that passage in their understanding of if, my, if a people calls upon God, he will covenant with them. All right? That was rejected during and after the Great Awakening, and, and Edwards rejects that. It was supplanted with the understanding of the necessity of an individual new birth and covenant with God. Okay? The church was no longer a breeding ground for national identity and covenant, but rather a collection of individuals who had openly professed Christ and exhibited a changed outward life due to this inward change in affections. The political and religious spheres no longer served as a cohesive whole, but were dis distinct identities. All right. So when you separate, uh, or when you when you come to the understanding that an individual is responsible for making a profession of faith, and and is not just a Christian because they're in a Christian society, or uh, one of the natural outworkings of that is is you start making that distinction then between church and state and say, well, maybe they actually have separate spheres of authority and they shouldn't be mingled. So if you break a civil law, it's not the church that should punish you, it's the state that should punish you. But if you break a biblical law, even if it's not illegal by the state, it's the church that's responsible for discipline. Do you see? Uh, and, and so... Uh, the, the, the distinction, no, we're no longer a nation that has to be a Christian nation. Uh, uh, but we can separate the two things, and, and, and we'll see how that plays out later in American political thought. Um, let's see. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll finish with this. The last two things. Significantly, Jonathan Edwards made his most forceful practical arguments about the nature of the covenant at exactly the time when the general effects of revivalistic Calvinism and the general drift of New England history were pushing toward new forms of thought. If the covenant was breaking apart as the prime metaphor for theological integration, it did not mean that New Englanders abandoned the search for intellectual integration as such. What surfaced as a replacement for the covenant was a melange of themes forged together by the fervor of the new evangelical piety and the heat of political conflict. In particular, the revival's shaking effects were the occasion for New Englanders to seek other means for shoring up the weakened canopy of biblical-oriented covenant theology. For many, the answer was some form of Republican political theory, which seemed to be, as elsewhere in the Atlantic world, in the words of Alistair McIntyre, the project of restoring a community of virtue. So they, they kind of supplanted that understanding of the church well, with the state. We, we now look to the state to help secure for us a, a civil society. And this was uh, kind of the breeding grounds, I think, for revolutionary thought, which was then kicked into high gear 
uh, and we'll end with this, by uh, another New England pastor, Jonathan Mayhew, who preached a sermon on December 31st, 1750, for the 100th anniversary of the execution of Charles I of England, called A Discourse Concerning Unlimited Submission and Non-Resistance to the Higher Power. The sermon proved pivotal in the development of American political resistance theory. Mayhew argued in this sermon that submission to authorities as dictated in Romans 13 is only necessary when the government is actually for your good. If the government began acting in ways that harmed, then they were to be removed and replaced. So I'm sure Steve will get more into that in the coming weeks. But that, that is one of the most influential sermons in the history of America because he specifically argues that if, in, from Romans 13, if the government is not for your good, well, then they are to be overthrown. And uh, that's something that Edwards himself would have rejected, but a lot of what Edwards kind of preached and the understanding of the individual uh, Made the, laid the groundwork for that. Anyway, so I hope that was helpful in understanding the Great Awakening. Uh, we didn't kind of, I don't know, a bit disjointed, but I appreciate your mercy. All right, let me, let me close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for how you have worked in history to accomplish your purposes and build your church. We pray now as we uh, gather for corporate worship, that you would edify us and uh, that you would exalt your son amongst us. In whose name we pray.